Thanks for listening to the nice podcast. I am available to deliver keynote presentations and workshops for your company or for your conference. Reach out to me, davedelaneyspeaks.com or email me and we can talk. Now on with the show. Hey, it's Jason with the Marketing Podcast Network. You have less than one month left to get special early bird pricing for the Creator Economy Expo 2023. This event, folks, is for content creators and entrepreneurs interested in building and growing their content-first businesses. Do not miss this show. Join over 500 bloggers, podcasters, authors, newsletter writers, speakers, consultants, and freelancers at the learning and networking event for content creators. Plan to attend May 1st through the 3rd in Cleveland, Ohio. Register now to secure early bird pricing before it disappears March 31st. Early bird pricing ends March 31st. As a special offer, you can get $100 off just for listening to MPN shows like this one. Go to cex.events to register. Use the coupon code MPN100. The address, the URL, cex.events. That's the whole thing. Type that into your browser. cex.events, the code you use, MPN100. The Creator Economy Expo, Cleveland, May 1st through the 3rd. See you there. We can't yeah. grow as a company unless all of us or some of us have access to what's in your brain. And so I think for companies and organizations to grow, there's got to be a way for others to be able to look at what others have done or what they hear or what they found or what they're working on so that we can co- so that we can collaborate and work together. Nice. 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 Nice with Dave Delaney. Today I'm speaking with Jane Allen, the Chief Executive Officer at Nashville Entrepreneur Center. Jane, I am thrilled to have you here. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Happy belated birthday. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> so did you uh, did you have some nice uh, birthday celebrations? You know, I did. I actually have three ch- or four children, and three of them were able to be here with us on Saturday. And so um, we, had a, we had a lot of good quality family time. Nice. How old are your kids? My youngest is 17, and that's my only female. And then I had three boys in three years. So I have 22, 23, and 25. Holy crow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. A lot of fun. So we actually, (laughs) my third born son, his friend is a walk-on at Vanderbilt basketball team. Right. And he's actually getting playing time. And so for my birthday, I wanted to go to the game. And, and see Drew play and let Ty be able to see Drew. And we did. And he got to play and they won. So it was it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. 17, 22, 23, 25. Yeah, our, our kids are 15 and 16 now. So I guess you're kind of seeing the light on the on the other end, right? Like the, the where, where they're not teenagers. Yeah, you know, it's so, I always said every age was the best age. And mm. now to have young adults who are so competent and so thoughtful and and wise. I just am somewhat in awe. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Every, yeah. like I said, I liked all the ages, um, but it continues. It continues to get better, even. Yeah, our son just got his first job uh, and started driving in October. So it's all happening so quickly now. It's yes. kind of it's kind of freaking us out. Yes, I remember that with my firstborn. Yeah, so. it's wild. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I like to start my my interviews here with a question, which is, what's the nicest thing someone has done for you recently? Well. That's a great question. And <laughs> there's been a lot of things, um, especially since I just had a birthday. Mm. Um, just people taking the time to remember. And and then actually this birthday, for whatever reason, you know, I actually took time to read every post. And when I would read every post, I would actually ha- think and, and have a memory about that person. Mm. Um, and so it made me appreciate just the simpleness of of take someone taking time to acknowledge, um, you know, and then other people flying in to spend a day (laughs) with me. And, um, you know, so again, I think you're hitting me right after a birthday. And, and I think that's one of those instances where I just, um, 
truly experience, and I'm grateful for people in my life that take time to give me a little piece of themselves. What are some good ways for uh, not just entrepreneurs, of course, but everyone listening? What are some some good ways for us to, or for for people to be more grateful? Um. I think it's an intentional act, just mm-hmm. my humble opinion. So, um, and taking time. I remember one of my birthdays, one of my employees, and it's hard to call him an employee because he was, he helped build the company. Um, so I probably partners, um, gave me a book of, and, and it was basically a journal so that each day I could write down things that I was grateful for. Nice. And so that became a mindset. And, and again, you know, and it's little things. It's not like that's what it made me realize. You know, the fact that I have a husband with a great sense of humor, um, that is something I'm very grateful for the longer we're together. You know, so it's, it's little things. So I think Dennis giving me that book and then me actually taking the time has created a mindset. And believe me, it's one I need to continue to work on, like mm. with anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but just a mindset to appreciate even the smallest of things. The fact that Clark always has a smile on his face yes. and has this voice that just brings you a little bit of joy. You know, it's just the small things in life. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. And did Dennis bring you that book when you were with uh, Council on Call? I was, yes. I, um, I, you know, we had started Council on Call and Dennis ran, or at that time, ran our Atlanta office. Mm. And um, he is just a dear, wonderful soul. And, and while we would have business discussions, we would also have life discussions. And so for one of my birthdays, Dennis gave me the book and asked me just to, you know, practice writing down things that I was grateful for. I love that. And it fits into sort of your your, uh, I, I wouldn't say, well, go, not goal, but, but when you ran, uh, council on call, I know that you, you know, you were talking about, I was reading a couple articles and, and was reading about you, uh, how you talked about putting yourself in other people's shoes and your mm-hmm. colleagues and your clients and, and treat, treating people the way you want to be treated, which is one of my like mantras at home, uh, you know, with the kids and, and with my family. That's mm-hmm. always been one, uh, an important one. Tell us a little bit about that. Like how, how do you, how do you practice empathy in this way? You know, it's funny because as someone that, you know, we start a business and I don't have the MBA. Um, and so, you know, you hear all of these terms you have, you know, and, and, and I happen to be married to a gentleman who had the MBA from Wharton and is very um, intelligent and experienced in, in starting and running businesses. But, you know, I knew you had to create a business plan. I knew you had to do various things, but they would say, oh, well, you have to have a mission. You have to have a vision. And, and, and I just remember, I mean, here I am a startup and, you know, but you do have people that you're coming in contact with. And so I just thought, you know, at the end of the day, I just think it's really important, whether it's the lawyer who did really well in law school and they've gone to the great firm and they're making good money, but they're not happy. Mm. And you're talking to them and you're trying to help them understand why they're not happy or whether it's the general counsel that's just been told that she has to cut 30% out of her budget. And all she's thinking is that means I have to lay off these people that I work with and I can't control how much work comes in. Mm. Or whether it's the gentleman who's there cleaning the office at 11 o'clock at night while I'm still there working and he has a smile on his face. And, you know, and it's, and so again, for me, it was just very simple that all of us are trying to work to hopefully leave the world a little better than we found it. And if we can at least have an appreciation from where that person is coming from and look at things through their lens versus our own, that might be able to help us create um, an atmosphere that we would all want to work in and all want to spend time in. So tell us a little bit about Council on Call. How was that mm-hmm. conceived and, and, and why? Like what was this sort of backstory there? Mm-hmm. I mean, 
the original idea was I saw as a lawyer, I mean, I was a lawyer. I had had the um, good fortune of having the opportunity to clerk for a federal judge, and I ended up going with a great firm. We were all former federal law clerks, did federal court litigation primarily. Mm. And... Um, and I just saw a lot of women leaving the profession and and just thought, wow, I mean, these are really smart, talented people who worked really hard to get the grades, to get the opportunities to go to the good firms and have good training. But yet when life intervened, it seemed that the profession um, wasn't flexible. And and I understood that. And But at the same time, I kept thinking, but there's got to be a way – to get work done without requiring somebody sit in the office and bill in the office day in and day out. And understanding this was in the 90s. Mm. And so I thought, well, if the woman whose mother is ill and she needs to go and be in Ohio while her mother is ill, you know, maybe she could actually still do some work from Ohio <laughs> um, and and not be sitting in the office. Or the obvious is the the parent with the child. Right. And so it all started thinking that while we have a very diverse profession and that so many people come into the legal profession, we all are not pre-law majors. Um, you come in with so many different backgrounds. When we would come out of law school, we all were sort of expected to go on the same path and the same track. Mm. And then at the same time, being in a law firm, realizing you have a variable client base, but a static hiring base. And just those plates just kept spinning and thinking there is a way to marry these two. Mm. Um, and then for my own practice, just thinking, you know, we have work that needs to be done, but I don't know that I necessarily need a full-time associate or associates because it's temporary, but there's these amazing people, primarily women, mm. at home, and could I tap into those individuals and give them the opportunity to stay connected to the profession and, and work on interesting things, but not have the burden of having the overhead and all of the, you know, downtime, so to speak, and is there a way to make all of this work? And so those were what I would call spinning plates and then, um, and then I tried it um, mm. as my children were born, and I saw that it could work. And and lawyers were calling, wanting to know how can I work like you work, and um, and I thought it was really quite simple. And in that, you know, you get paid for when you're billing work, and and you know, and yeah. and 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 you you work on a team. And then at the same time, my husband, again, was, I think you're on to the future of the legal profession. Um, there's only, a, this is done in other industries. It's only a matter of time till it's done in law. And that was enough of an impetus for me to go out and start talking to federal judges and others about this idea or concept. And with that, it took off. That's amazing. That's What a cool, what a cool story. And I think you know, really innovative for its time. And, and you consider nowadays too how things have changed and where, you know, so many more people are, are, are working from home, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not just for mat leave, of course, but <laughs> mm -hmm. it's interesting too. I mean, I think what are, you, what are your thoughts on the sort of the state of parenting of new parent uh, parenting leave in, in, I guess in this country, in this state, I know like more companies are taking the lead to say, hey, you know, you get X months or weeks off or what have you and they're paid and so on. But I'm Canadian, right? So I'm from, okay. uh, so, <laughs> Got it. so my wife, who's from Tennessee, uh, lived in Toronto with me, uh, for, for, and we, when we were married and we were there for six years before moving uh, to Nashville. And while there we had both kids and my wife was like flabbergasted that in Ontario, legally they have to keep your job for a year, but the government pays like 80% of your wages, give or take. For, and you, for 12 months and you can also split that. So like the mother can do six months paid maternity and then the father could do six months paternity if the mother wants to go back to work and so on. Usually it's better in that order uh, for obvious reasons. Um, what are your thoughts on, on this, the state of, of this here? 
you know, I mean, that's a complicated question to, um, mm. because I can see it from an employer's perspective and mm. an employee's perspective, from a parent's perspective. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think it's that simple. We have chosen to live in a country um, that has a different form of government than Canada. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in Tennessee, we had 16 weeks leave allowed by the state government that mm. we could exercise if we so chose. And then employers could pay for that or pay part of that or get insurance to help cover the cost of that. Mm. Um, and so, again, I don't. I don't know that I have a specific opinion on that because, quite honestly, no one's ever asked. Um, but with most questions similar to that, I would say it's complicated because I think I could see it through the lens of the employer and trying to manage margins and trying to make sure you're profitable and trying to make sure you also get the work done and trying to be able to do that. Um, and then at the same time, from the lens of the employee – and the new parent, both male and female. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I just think it's a little complicated. Yeah, it, de uh, it definitely is. Yeah, we're not we're not solving mm -hmm. the world's problems uh, <laughs> right now. We can do that over over a coffee later. Exactly. Um, right. <laughs> so uh, tell me a little bit. So you you started running uh, the o Entrepreneur Center. And for those listening who are not familiar, do you want to maybe briefly describe what the EC is? Sure. Um, the the Nashville Entrepreneur Center is an organization. It's a nonprofit that was started, gosh, 11, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. It was really ahead of its time. Um, but what a lot of people may not realize is Nashville is a very entrepreneurial town. Mm. We have had amazing success stories come out of this community, which is one reason we started our Circle Back podcast, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. is to help capture and share the stories of people that helped build this city. And so you did, like even when I when we started Council on Call, I just cold called people in this town that had successful businesses and asked if they would meet with me and everyone said yes. Mm -hmm. And then it would be, you know, they would help me, whether it was teaching me about goal setting or teaching or talking to me about, you know, the importance of your margin or your real estate cost or whatever it was. And some of it would just quite candidly duplicate what my spouse was saying to me. But on the other hand, some of it would stretch you know, and, and help me grow and learn. And so what the community decided to do, we were birthed out of the Chamber of Commerce, um, is a way to have a front door for entrepreneurship in Nashville. And so that people like myself, if it had existed, could have come here and then get connected to the resources they need to increase their probability of success. And those resources very well may be what we now call phase four entrepreneurs, um, those who have had successful exits, who are willing to give time to help give a hand up to the generation coming behind them. Mm. It might be access to, you know, um, accountants or lawyers or marketing experts. It might be access to industry expertise. And so it really is a very, while we have programs who have amazing success rates, 84% mm. of those who come through our existing programs still employ people and or have had successful exits. Um, it really is individualized too, because what we have are these entrepreneur and residents who are all well well experienced wealth of information that then help match the right advisors, mentors, and bring in the resources that they need. At the same time, creating a community of entrepreneurs who are similarly situated. And so we have space where they can um, office. We have um, bays where like a whole program will um, office out of and, and meet afterwards and create community. So it is just this amazing nonprofit that was the vision of entrepreneurs and business people in this town who wanted to give time and money to help that next generation to keep that entrepreneurial spirit, which is what I call, which I think is in the tapestry of what makes this city such a special place to be. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember it's interesting. And for folks who are not familiar, yeah, the, the, 
the building itself is is in, built in the original in the trolley barns in in Nashville, and it's just an incredible an incredible space, and, and also incredible upgrade from the original EC where I remember spending time in the in the dark caverns of the uh, <laughs> of a, an upstairs office space on Lower Broadway. So um, uh, it it is a, a really great great space as well um and it's funny yeah and i would say on that i mean it is it's a very um open space a very cool space but like during the pandemic it was what do entrepreneurs need and you would see these entrepreneurs with their iphones trying to do video to put on their websites and it was they really need a broadcast studio because Mm. they're professionals and they Mm. need to make sure their content is of the quality that would give confidence to potential customers and or their investors. And so we have amazing people in our community. And, you know, one couple stepped up and helped us build this, you know, fabulous um, broadcast studio that our entrepreneurs now have access to and can utilize. And so again, it's, it's a very dynamic space. The first CEO, Michael Burcham, was a visionary mm-hmm. and very dynamic space that continues to grow and evolve as our community and the needs of our community grow and evolve. But I will say the Today Show said, if you come to Nashville and you're entrepreneurial, you've got to go to the Nashville Entrepreneur Center. And I agree with them. It's a yeah. really cool asset that our community has. And you've you've been at the EC, excuse me, for 2020 or 2020, 2020 I, right? My first day was October 21st, 2019. 19, yes. okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so the last two months of 19 and then all of 2020 and 2021. Right. So what were your biggest challenges at the offs? Like when you, when you began the role, what were your, what were your challenges like then? You know, it was, I met with over 300 people in the community in the first 90 days Mm. because I knew that we were at an inflection point of what does the future of this organization look like and what, what are the needs for 2020 moving forward versus what the needs were in 2010 Mm -hmm. and trying to listen to different stakeholders in our community. And then, you know, being able to do that, I always say it's, you know, changing the tires while you're running down the highway. And that's what any entrepreneur does. Sure. And in some ways, this is an entrepreneurial organization that was ready to move to the next stage of, of, I would call it growing up. Mm -hmm. And so it was, you know, being in a position to be able to put together a strategic plan and work with the board, it was important for me to do a really deep dive very quickly. And so I think that was it. But thankfully, you'd think we knew a pandemic was coming because (laughs) I finished the meetings January 31st. We had our board strategic meeting, I think it was February 19th. Mm. And then, of course, the pandemic hit in March. And so we have been very well poised because – we have our mission and our vision and our three to five year strategic plan that helps set the framework for everything that we have been doing and have done during the pandemic as well as coming out of the pandemic, or maybe we're still in the pandemic. Um, but, you know, we went virtual before most went virtual. Um, you know, we had already looked at our programs and trying to be able to reach um, entrepreneurs without them all having to drive down to this cool space every every week. I mean, so we were already putting things in play that we were able to flip the switch on very fast so that we were able to expand our um, reach into the entrepreneurial community at a time when I think it's you need entrepreneurs even more because entrepreneurs are typically problem solvers and we had plenty of problems that needed to be solved. Yeah, and as you transition into uh, the pandemic, you know when when a lot of what this what this the place is about is the space to bring people together, mm-hmm. you know, under one roof, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, are, are were there concerns for you for the the future of of the organization as as it is as the space is is you know apl- applied here? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I think- it's a big, beautiful space, but it's also right where like a future condo could go and, and, and the rate of condo growth in Nashville, it's kind of astronomical. So, well, we're in the <laughs> historical, we're in the old trolley barns. Yes. And so the city made a commitment 
as far as preserving a bit of our history right. in, in, in amongst all the growth. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was never really worried about that. Quite frankly, I was more worried about the entrepreneurs and the community we serve. Mm. And so what many may not remember is we had a tornado hit a week before the pandemic. And the tornado hit East Nashville and North Nashville. And we uh, there were a lot of entrepreneurs that lost everything. Yep. And so having been an entrepreneur and realizing you need to make payroll, whether you have internet or electricity or not, we went and in, in our community, we went and just let people know our doors were open and and we would find a place for them here. And so we, even though we had a waiting list to get in at that time, we set up tables <laughs> um, and, you know, we just had people here getting access to the things that they needed until they could come up with their plan A. You know, we were sort of the, um, you know, what's that called in the emergency, the triage. Right. To at least allow them to meet payroll, to get their bills out, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, you have the pandemic that came right behind it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people still needed these doors to be open. And so while, yes, we had to shut down for the 30 days that the mayor mandated everyone shut down, mm -hmm. we felt that we were an essential business because you had entrepreneurs who had children now at home working and they needed a space. Yeah. And you had people that needed the high-speed internet. And so while we definitely saw an attrition of the number of people that came back, we never questioned whether there was a need to have a space available. Then it became working with my staff and making sure safety. And we had a woman on our staff who was so committed and really had done the research of how could you open safely and we had to go to the expense of having extra cleaning and, you know, all of those things. And so then it becomes an operational puzzle um, with cutting expenses and seeing can we really keep the doors open. And so I believe as the leader of the Entrepreneur Center that we as an organization need to model mm. um, being a good business. And so we really we put together a four step um, expense cutting <laughs> plan. And yeah. thankfully, we didn't have to get to step four, which was shutting the doors. Yeah. And so we were able to be able to make some cuts, tighten our belts, um, and then again, really be the eyes and ears of the needs of the community during a very challenging time. Yeah, and it sure was. I mean, just personally speaking, my my kids' school was wiped out in the tornado, and then uh, a direct a derecho or de whatever they're whatever they're called derecho. Yes. Uh, yeah, that hit. Yes. Yeah, that, hit. that was new to me. I wasn't. Yes. I, I was like straight line winds. Hey, eh? what could that do? And uh, we were displaced from our home for three months after that one. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, I uh, you know, and then yeah, dropped the pandemic in the middle of all of that. And, uh, it was, uh, yeah, more than, uh, more than a stressful period. One thing that I found too, and also something that you mentioned in the Nashville Post article that I read about, about you, um, you know, you talked about a shared, uh, feeling of loneliness, um, as one of the biggest challenges for, for women in leadership, um, uh, I would I would also add, you know, for 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 everybody, really uh, tell me a little bit about how entrepreneurs can can combat that that loneliness. And I know and I, that may be part of what I was getting at with having this wonderful place where where people can congregate. Sure. And of course, I can only speak for myself. I never profess to speak on behalf of every <laughs> entrepreneur or everything yeah, else. But sure. I do think. And, and, and I think where I come from as a woman entrepreneur mm. who is also a mother, a wife, and a child, and a sibling, and a niece, I mean, yeah. you have a lot of hats you wear. Mm. And so I never felt I had the time to invest deeply in meaningful friendships outside of the responsibilities I already carried. Mm. And so I – or I chose not to, all right, because time is something everybody has and it's how you allocate it. And so I chose to be building the 
business and working in the business and working with my clients and my and my clients were both the paying clients and my lawyers and or the team members that that came on board to help grow this um, vision into a reality and into a real company mm-hmm. and family. And so, um, you know, I didn't have the, I never did the peer groups. And so I know like you have EO and you have YPO. I just never felt that I could commit to those. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so for me, the Entrepreneur Center, the other thing that I've said is, you know, you get to the point where you do exit which is fabulous, but I've never felt more lonely Mm. because so much of my life was tied with those employees and those people. I don't like to use the word employees, but those people who worked with me each and every day and the customers. And I have chosen to bring in a new leader, even though I'm still a shareholder, I chose to bring in a new CEO and I felt you can only have one leader. And so I had to extricate myself from everything. Mm. And all of a sudden, it's like, wow, now what do I do? And I didn't know where to go. And so one of the first things I did after arriving at the EC was create this life cycle of the entrepreneur and divide it into four phases based on where someone is in their business. And phase four are people who have had exits. And creating a peer group where now we meet every quarter. Mm. And and it's people that have lived here all their life and people that have moved in after a successful exit in California or whatever it might be. But they all have things in common. And then what's really awesome is we have entrepreneurs that are in our program and our community that come in and talk about what keeps them awake at night. Because every person in that room has walked in their shoes regardless of the industry. Huh. And so it's really been and powerful to watch and to witness. And um, and I think people really appreciate. And so it's no different for those that are in phase one, phase two, or phase three. Yes, you can come and be in a program, but you also can just be a member of the Entrepreneur Center. And yes, we will have events, but we also can connect you to an advisor or a mentor. Or this year, we're going to do like different panel discussions on topics that people care about or do little mini boot camps. So again, it's a way for you to pour into your business, but Mm. also pour into yourself a little bit by meeting others who are similarly situated. Do you think it's, uh go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. But I think, and so I think it is because for some entering a program that's a year long, that's, that's, that's a big commitment. Right. I love that so many do it. Quite candidly, I don't know that I would have. <laughs> but if yeah. somebody would have told me how to go from being a single sales person to creating a sales process so you can hire people, I would have been all over that. I would have come, I would have, because I was trying to create it on my own. Or if somebody would have said, so, all right, you think you may want to get an outside investor. Here's everything you need to know before you even go down that path. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are little like deeper dives that I think entrepreneurs in our community would value, but yet they don't have the ability to get fully immersed in a whole program. And so when you do that, you will meet others who are similar to you and hopefully create a little bit of a connection, but also spend time on your business. Because I think that's what most entrepreneurs spend the most of their time on is the business. What would you do if you were starting a, a startup today and you were in like New York City? I would move to Nashville. <laughs> Because I think Nashville is the best place to start and grow a business. Well um, played. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, but I'm I mean, joking. I'm not. Yeah. Um, you know, because I do. I think we, you know, now, of course, everybody's figuring us out. Um, but I always said we were the best kept secret and in, in, in that we have a wonderful quality of life. It used to be very affordable. Um, <laughs> and, and, and quite honestly, as a CEO of a large company with offices all over the country, if not the world, it's still affordable. Um, you know, you don't have to pay for parking, you know, depending on where you choose to put your headquarters. And right. um, and everybody is, it's the Kevin Bacon theory. Everybody is a phone call away. I mean, we're yeah. still a small town in a big city. And I think a lot of us hope that we can keep that as we manage the growth. Yeah, I would love to talk to new 
entrepreneurs who are going through that same smiling and dialing and trying to schedule coffees in the city and whether they're having the same luck that you did and the same luck that I did, quite frankly. I mean, when I moved to Nashville, it was 07 and I met uh, Hannah uh, from, uh, Hannah, formerly Paramore. And she introduced yeah. me to, to Clint Smith and Clint introduced me to Marcus Whitney and Marcus Whitney and I conceived bar camp. And then Marcus at the end of that coffee was like, Oh, by the way, Clint wants to hire you. And I said, okay. And then I went and worked with Emma. Um, so like, you know, and then after leaving Emma to go out and do my own thing, suddenly next thing I know, I've got, you know, Dave Owens and Mark Rowan over at Griffin saying, Hey, let's go for lunch. And next thing I know, they're making me, they're like, you have to, you have to take a job at Griffin. And so next thing I knew I was, I had to write my own job description for my job at Griffin technology. And I'm uh, proud to say that I got the job. That would have been really embarrassing. I was going to say that would have been bad. <laughs> Can you imagine writing your own job description and not getting the job? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Big mistake there. But, but there's a long winded way of saying that I've always found, uh, yeah, folks in, in Nashville, very, very welcoming. And, and I hope that stays. And I will say that's honestly what happens here yeah um you know what i mean any business what's your differentiator quite frankly ours are people like clint smith and beth chase and marcus and others Mm -hmm. and we have a community full of those people and it's expanded even more through this phase four group because now when people move in from california or new york or chicago or san diego or anywhere else there is a group they can immediately fit right into Mm. and then there is this um, generosity spirit, generous spirit that mm. tends to take over. And so that happens here every single day. And I, I mean, that's why I'm like, you've got Beth Chase and Catherine yeah. that are EIRs in our in-flight program. No entrepreneur could afford the wisdom of these women. And the fact yeah. that they're volunteering all of these hours to pour into you, I'm like, I'm sorry, you need to take the time to go through the one-year program because this is unbelievable, you know, consulting that you're getting through a program that is supported by successful business people and entrepreneurs in our community. And that is exactly what the National Entrepreneur Center is and does and hopefully will continue to do as we continue to move forward. Did you get a knack for building community being from a like you're from uh, Russell Kentucky right mm-hmm. and so that's that's a city with you know roughly three or four thousand people so growing up in a, in a smaller community is that did you did you take things away from that experience and apply them to to what you're doing now oh wow that's a great question um I had never thought about that mm. um in some ways I think I was born this way mm. um you know my mother um you know, I probably resemble her more than my father, even though my father was very, um, you know, um, a people, I mean, he, he was very loyal friend Mm -hmm. and, um, but you know, my mother was a nurse, which I think is a calling, Mm -hmm. um, teachers and nurses and, and others obviously, but I mean, she was a care, I don't know. So in a small town, you know, maybe, um, Maybe I, I I I would have to I would probably have to give more thought to that to see um, how much of an influence I was the I was the youngest of four mm. so when my siblings needed to sell candy or any magazines I was always the person to go door to door and do all the sales for them <laughs> um, you know so I, I, there's probably a variety of different reasons um, and and I learned to talk to people in our neighborhood. So maybe that's a small town. I mean, you did let your seven-year-old kid go door to door to forty different houses with people you didn't really know that well. Yeah, and 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 I would, and I would get to know them, and I would know everything about them, <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, and then I became friends with them, and you know, um, yeah. So maybe maybe a small town from that aspect, in that I was free to roam, so to speak. Yeah, I, I interviewed Jeffrey Shaw. He's an author and, and speaker and just a great guy on the show a few episodes back. And he was telling me this story. He, he grew up in a, a rural community and he, he would sell uh, eggs to like uh, chicken eggs. And he would actually like, they, he'd actually make them a little dirtier. 
to make them look even fresher. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> and he would drive his car, his parents or his siblings car at like, I think he was 14 uh, and, and selling these eggs door to door. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was quite an interesting entrepreneurial journey for him because he started, uh, uh, doing photography and then landed on, uh, doing a family portrait, uh, to people at a golf course and realized, wait a minute. And so he started putting up signs all around the golf course for his services. And next thing he knew, he was like that golf course photographer, basically. Wow. And, uh, and yeah, he, he followed that. He followed that. It was pr- pretty clever. What did your, uh, your mom was a nurse. What did your father do? Um, my father was actually a federal agent. Oh, nice. And, mm-hmm. and so, um, yeah. So That's interesting. I bet he had some interesting stories. Oh, he did. Yes. <laughs> yes. And he was a great storyteller. Yeah. Um, a fabulous storyteller. And, um, but yeah. What about, what about your siblings? What do they do? <laughs> um, my sister was a lawyer, and then she was the first female dean of the University of Georgia Law School, but the first female dean in the Southeastern Conference. Wow, that's amazing. And yeah, she's an amazing, brilliant, beautiful human being. Um, my brother, John, he works with Aramark Corporation. He's a senior executive. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's a, um, again, I, I'm partial, I know, but I also think I'm honest. Um, yeah. You know, he's just amazing. Yeah. And then my brother, Tom, is um, this, he's talking about a giving heart spirit. Um, as well. He was a teacher hmm. and then became a superintendent. And he was superintendent of the year for the state of Kentucky. And then start and then he had some health challenges and started a company. Yeah. And now he's retired. And um, we're just waiting for this pandemic to get over so the four of us can get together. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. That's amazing. So, and, and, your, so your parents obviously gave you some sort of uh, correct uh, inspiration there by the sounds of it to, to kind of push you in the right direction. And it's interesting that, you know, uh, it sounds like a lot of sort of entrepreneurial kind of blood in the family there. Yeah, I think that my um, actually my parents divorced when I was seven and we were one of the only divorced families in the community. Mm. And um, my father had started a TV business back when he was in the police academy, I think, and it Mm. did not do well. My mother was a nurse. And when I was in late high school, early college, she we lived in Florida at that time. And she would come home and talk about the need, because she was working at a very high end nursing home. And Mm. she would talk about the need for there to be a place for people that really were not meant to be in a nursing home, but the kids lived up north and they didn't have anywhere to put their parents. Mm. And so she actually took her savings and created a home for six women, um, maybe seven. And, um, you know, and she would bring in jazzercise and have their hair and have, I mean, <sighs> do their diet, but yeah, yeah. good food. And it would be what most would view as one of the first assisted living facilities. So, you know, um, she was very entrepreneurial in her own way. And I think that's one reason I'm here Mm. is because she didn't have anything like the Entrepreneur Center. She didn't have the business acumen. She just had the vision and saw the need, but did not know how to make money and ended up having to sell it instead of filing bankruptcy. Mm. And, um, And so I think that when you can take someone like that and pair them to allow them to learn while investing in the business, but learn where the money's coming in and where it's going and margin and all of those good things that those people help me understand, um, then I think we're doing, we're doing good for our community and helping create successful entrepreneurs who ultimately create jobs and, um, and hopefully do things to help us live in a better place. How can you, how can you record or, or keep track? I mean, um, you know, obviously, you know, your siblings le- learned lessons there and you and, and you did too, but are, are there ways, but you also talked a little bit of, uh, previously about, um, you know, initially coming to Nashville meeting with, or, or taking the job and meeting with, with people and getting a lot of information sort of about the lay of the land and so on. Mm-hmm. But did you, I'm, I'm curious, you know, for other entrepreneurs listening mm-hmm. who, you know, maybe scheduling coffee meetings with, with other folks to learn from them and so on. 
how how would you record that information? Did you record that information? Meaning like, did you journal it? Did you put it in a spreadsheet? Did you like just, you know, store it all in your head? And you know, <laughs> how did yeah. you, how did you keep track of what you were learning? I record everything. Ah, interesting. Um, okay. When I was practicing law and, um, and got pregnant, I realized I could go on bed rest tomorrow mm -hmm. <laughs> and my client's matters needed to go forward. And so I started chronicling conversations or follow-ups or anything that needed to happen. And so mm. I actually started it in my legal profession. And then once with, you know, starting counsel on call, I would I would record anyone I spoke with in the essence of the conversation and then created the database or, you know, we bought an off the shelf software at the beginning mm. um, that we just kept everything in. Um, and so even at the EC, you know, same thing. I always say, if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, everything needs to keep me being moved forward. Yeah. And so if there are conversations or things that have occurred, I need my team to be able to pick up and keep moving forward and, and not let, you know, the fact that I didn't take time to record things be a problem. So I actually record, I mean, when I say everything, but important conversations that help us be able, and then it also allows me to go back and review, like, okay, I heard a great idea. I remember such and such told me that. What exactly was that? Right. And so it allows me to go back and get it as well. So yes. That's brilliant. And I love, maybe your, maybe that came from your dad somehow with his work uh, with intel, intelligence. It's like recording, take notes. Mm -hmm. um, no, but I love that too, because I think it, it is such an important thing because yeah, I mean, as you said, it's a, you know, it, it's an idea bank, but it's also a relationship bank where you can go back and try to find, you know, who told you what and, and kind of piece it back together. And the other side of it too, as you, as you were saying, is making sure that your team members are, uh, you know, armed with everything they need, you know, God forbid, you're not able to, to show up to work. And, um, you know, I, I, I think of that with myself and my own business, you know, making sure with future forth that my wife has passwords to everything and she knows how to, to, you know, uh, who the clients are and so forth so that she can, she can follow up with people too. If, you know, God forbid, I, I get hit by a bus or something. Yeah. And I think that, and it, and it goes both ways. I mean, right. part of my job is to create a sustainable organization. And so making sure that the information and I, you know, and things that other people are doing are also captured mm. so that if anybody, I mean, I remember at one time at Council on Call, it was trying to get a couple of my first employees to capture notes and mm -hmm. make sure everything was documented and had amazing, um, couple of women that helped in the very beginning and they were truly amazing and such a gift. And one of them, she hated doing it, hated doing it. Mm. But finally she was supposed to go on vacation. Her first vacation was her sister's wedding. And I was like, before you leave, please just put everything in the database. And so I remember, you know, she called and she's like, okay, I'm getting ready to leave and everything's in the database. Well, unfortunately she had, she suffered a stroke Oh, and no. yeah, and it was awful. It was so awful. And you would, I would have never guessed it. Um, I mean, in that I would have, I mean, it wasn't that I was trying to get her to do that because I thought no, no, no. Yeah, no, no, no. it was just, we can't yeah. grow as a company unless all of us or some of us have access to what's in your brain. And so I think for companies and organizations to grow, there's got to be a way for others to be able to look at what others have done or what they hear or what they found or what they're working on so that we can, so that we can collaborate and work together. And, you know, and that just sort of was the exclamation point on, mm. oh my gosh, this is so important. Yeah, no, it is. And it's a good, good reminder to everybody listening. All right. I'm going to move to the lightning round because I know okay. I've got to be respectful of your time here. So complete this sentence. Nice guys and gals finish. First. <laughs> What's a nice book that you recommend to the nice makers? A nice book. Well, all right. This is going to sound weird, but the Bible. All right. Uh, any, any new Old Testament, any sort of? I just, for me, 
there were moments, in, especially in li- entrepreneurial journey, but even life, mm. where it's like, oh, my word, I just can't do this. Uh-huh. And then, I don't know, I would just find like there was a scripture about, let me take your yoke. And I would literally, I could just picture taking the yoke off my shoulder and giving it away. Mm. And it just allowed me to sit up a little tighter or with you, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, just the little, just little snippets that it would be, you know, put a smile on, be a light, try to be a positive in this world and hopefully make a difference and make a positive impact. And so for me, that really is the book that has stood the test of time. Um, I've read lots and lots of books, but that's the one I still keep going back to no matter what my journey is. How is Jane nice to herself? That's a work in progress. (laughs) Um, I think it's what I said about my birthday. It's taking the time to read each post, even if it's happy birthday and then taking the time to think, how do I know this person? And allowing those memories to sink in and bring a smile to my face. Um, and so I think it's really just taking time hmm. um, to allow myself to read or to do a devotional or to read the Wall Street Journal. Or, you know, it's, yeah. t- it's giving myself permission to take time. If you had a billboard, what would it say? It would be a pair of shoes with put yourself in the other person's shoes. I love it. Jane, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. How can folks get a hold of you? Um, it's Jane period Allen at ec.co. Cool. Well, thanks a million. Uh, I will, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Nice Podcast. I'm Dave Delaney, and you can get in touch with me at futureforth.com. We want to be able to hear from you, so I want to include your voice on an upcoming episode. To do this, record a voice comment or share a question at nicepodcast.co. There, you will also find a listener survey, and you can share how we're doing and your feedback with us there, too. And if you like what we're doing here, please be sure to follow and subscribe to the show. And of course, your ratings and reviews are very much appreciated. Thank you for this. Our theme music is by Alistair Crystal, who you can hear more from at alistaircrystal.ca. All right, thanks for being here, and we will see you next time. Be nice. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Lacey Boggs hosts and produces a great podcast called A Stone Marketing Detective, a little bit different than your normal podcast on MPN. Lacey, tell us what these fine folks will get when they listen. A Stone Marketing Detective is a fully scripted and produced fictional radio play that follows crack marketing detective A Stone as she bamboozles the bad guys and detects dastardly deeds in the marketing industry. The podcast is a funny, tongue-in-cheek look at content marketing, shady marketers, and suspicious marketing techniques online. And I think it's a fun new way to have a business podcast that improves that marketing can be playful and effective. Where can people subscribe to this thing? You can go to acemarketingdetective.com or find it in your favorite podcast player or go to the Marketing Podcast Network. You heard her. Go subscribe.